Hello, everyone. And on behalf of RSNA, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. My name is Mary Mahoney. I'm the Benjamin Felsen Chair and Professor of Radiology at the University of Cincinnati. I'm also the President-Elect and Secretary-Treasurer of the RSNA Board of Directors. So as we all continue to work through and try to address the issues related to COVID-19, this webinar is one of the many ways that RSNA is trying to reach out to the radiology community, provide education, and provide resources on COVID-19. You can find many of these resources in the COVID-19 section of the RSNA website. It's updated weekly, sometimes daily, pretty consistently. And there's also a, a link to the website and to that page provided in the chat and the resource panel that are connected to this webinar. So we've got a pretty exciting session. We've got some great speakers. What I'd like to do now is to introduce our moderators, Dr. Mahmoud Moshabasa and Dr. Christopher Filippi, who will be co-moderating today's session. So Dr. Moshabasha is an associate professor of radiology and he's the Chief of Service at the University of Washington. He's Vice Chair of Clinical Operations, and he's Chair of our COVID RSNA Task Force. Dr. Felipe is Vice Chair of Biomedical Engineering and Translational Science. He's a Professor of Radiology at Lenox Hill and at Northwell Health in New York. He's currently Senior Editor of the American Journal of Neuroradiology and Chair of the Artificial Intelligence Task Force for the American Society of Neuroradiology. So we're going to begin with Dr. Moshe Basha, and I'm going to hand it off to you now. Thank you so much, Dr. Mahoney, for the uh, wonderful presentation. We're really excited about the, uh, the uh, course we have uh, set up for you and the speakers we have who are really fantastic. We have Drs. Mitch Schnall, Carolyn Meltzer, Laura Oliaga, and Bian Sutan uh, speaking to us. Before we introduce the speakers, there are a few things uh, that we want to let you know. You may follow the steps on the screen and in the chat panel to claim one CME credit for the webinar. Here is the disclosure and accreditation statement. And here is the RSNA disclaimer. Please use the question panel to submit your questions during the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on RSNA's YouTube page within about one business day after this event. Now I would like to present our first speaker, Dr. Mitch Schnall. Dr. Schnall is the Eugene P. Pendergrass Professor of Radiology and Chairman for the Department of Radiology at the Paramount School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Dr. Schnall. Thank you. I wanna spend the next few minutes talking about some of the basic organizational principles for an effective radiology department um, as a prelude to some of the uh, things that we'll hear uh, in, in a few minutes about how to lead in, in, in the crisis. Um, we all have, and I will say, preface my remarks by saying there's no one way, and I'll talk about some of the things that we're doing at Penn that we think have been successful for us. Um, we all have uh, organizational charts. This is our organizational chart. I will say at Penn, our, uh, our culture is, uh, we don't dwell on organizational charts. In fact, our CEO um, doesn't like organizational charts and, and, and you never wanna bring an organizational chart to a meeting with them. So we think in terms of a framework for organization in, in radiology. And when we think about radiology, there are three major axes that we uh, think about this uh, framework in. Um, we have um, an axis of subspecialty, the traditional neuroradiology, body radiology, chest. We have an axis that uh, deals with modality, MRI, CT, uh, RNF, uh, nuclear medicine. And then we have multiple entities in another axis, um, uh, whether it's HUP, PH, these are different hospitals or, or clinics that we run. And so we think about um, foci of accountability and responsibility along these axes. Um, so for example, um, in our subspecialty axis, we have divisions with division heads. 
we are um, very much um, aligned with trying to create uh, multiple components of leadership, marrying uh, administrative directors and, and, and clinical directors. So we've got entity directors, which include a chair and a technical director, a dyad of leadership. And in our modalities, we have a modality chief, which is a physician, uh, maybe a neuroradiologist, but in that instance serves actually as a uh, multi-specialty physician, um, a technical supervisor. And we have technical educators who are responsible for taking uh, the uh, aspects that are going on in, um, in the modality and teaching it across different entities. We rely on a matrix of collaboration between these different axes in order to actually get our work done and, and move in a, in, in, in a positive direction. Once you have your organizational framework, you really have to focus on communication. Uh, effective communication is critical to a department. We use a multi-threaded strategy of electronic communication, personal communication, tiered communication. Uh, experts will tell you you need to communicate something seven times to maximize the getting the effectiveness of a message to your organization. So, so you need to communicate multiple times and almost can never over communicate. And one of the things that we like to think about is the department's job to communicate effectively. So if I send an email and somebody complains they, they didn't know about something because they didn't get an email rather than criticize them, I have to think that that email was not an effective communication and I have to do a better job communicating. The other thing that we do is we put a fair amount of investment in our leadership. We have a leadership development program. It's broad and groups it includes physician leadership, technical leadership and administrative leadership, about 40 people for our department. Everybody gets a personal leadership coach. Uh, we do yearly retreat and then quarterly programs, uh, usually centered around specific um, topics. And these are some of the topics that we've dealt with. Um, and you can see multiple topics related to uh, organizing and managing in, in a radiology department. We are very, very uh, uh, focused on culture at Penn Radiology. Uh, we very much believe in the, 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 the value of culture, eat strategy for breakfast, technology for lunch, and everything else for dinner. We're very intentional about our culture. We, we um, look to um, what our culture is currently we even look at how we want to evolve our culture to add some agility and, and make more feedback rich. And so how do we think about developing, cultivating, and, and managing our culture? I like to think of it in the three M's, model, manage, message, and manage. We, we want to, as leaders, we need to model culture. We need to be able to model the behaviors and values consistent with our target culture. People look at you as a leader and look at what you do. If, if, if you're sending emails to everybody on Saturday, you can't wonder why everybody thinks they have to work on Saturday. It's because they're watching you work on Saturday, they're gonna work on Saturday. So you, people are gonna pay a lot of attention to what you do and uh, that's gonna influence your culture. Message, you know, we, we wanna message and highlight the expected behaviors and, and belief in all of our both inward and outward facing messaging. Um, we like to think of it in terms of uh, wearing our culture on our sleeve. We want everybody to know where it is. That will attract people to your organization that resonate with your culture and actually push people away from your organization that don't resonate with your culture, which I think is just as important. And then manage. We integrate our culture and our operations uh, into our yearly review and incentive plan, um, as well as we recruit for culture. And just a comment on recruiting for culture. In academic medicine, we have a tendency to focus on what we call technical competencies in recruitment. Do people publish well? They have grant funding. Are they outstanding clinicians? Um, but we also think that you've got to think a lot about behavioral competencies and we tend to undersell these. And so we recruit for behavioral competencies that we think are consistent with our culture. I will say that it's actually easier to have someone and develop an additional technical competency than changing their behavioral competencies. So it's almost more important to recruit on behavioral competencies. And finally, creating a feedback rich environment. We think a healthy organization is one that has a feedback rich environment. Uh, we need to learn to receive feedback. We need to model and message about feedback. And we find it useful to have a, a framework by which we create feedback. So we have this framework of competencies that we talk about, and we use these in providing feedback. Um, so in our yearly reviews, we talk about competencies, not necessarily every one of these, somewhere somebody may be strong, somewhere there might be opportunities. 
And one of the things I find useful personally in, in having these conversations is to start things off by pointing to where I think I'm weak and I have opportunities. And that makes it okay for someone and to uh, uh, be able to have opportunities and take some of the defensiveness away from that conversation and makes it a, a more rich conversation. So I really appreciate the opportunity to have uh, uh, shared some of our uh, leadership style uh, with you. And now we're gonna hear about how that leadership style um, can uh, be effective in managing in the crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Schnall. That was a really outstanding presentation. And um, I really look forward to your participation in the panel later. Next, we'll be hearing from Dr. Carolyn Meltzer. She is a member of the um, RSNA board as well as a liaison for the RSNA COVID-19 task force. So welcome, Dr. Meltzer. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Felipe. I'm uh, delighted to be here. So I wanted to talk about the specific instance of leadership in the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is very much an example of disruptive change uh, and disruptive change that we've never seen before. So not only is it a, is it a uh, healthcare crisis, a public health crisis, but our systems have been overwhelmed. Um, there is fear and grief amongst our uh, workers, our faculty, staff, and trainees. Fear of getting infection, grief of um, maybe losing a loved one, maybe not being able to say, say goodbye to a parent or grandparent who is in a nursing home and may have gotten sick with COVID. Maybe it's grief from losing aspects of their life um, that are not possible right now. And that includes socializing with family members who may have risk. Um, and the, we also suffer as a whole with the moral burden of putting off care that is non-urgent. So we've gone through, in, depending on what part of the world you were in and what part of uh, the United States, if you're in the United States you've been in, um, there have been peaks and valleys in where I live um, at Emory University in Georgia. We are reaching a peak of cases that is surpassing what we saw two months ago. So we were just starting to catch up on care and we're learning more about the patients we don't see and potentially negative outcomes to them not seeking care. The social distancing, we cannot say enough about how much we miss interacting with our colleagues and friends and family. So that is also a significant burden. So when I think about my leadership team, we, uh, like Dr. Stahl, have worked a lot on culture and on how we've organized our leadership. And we very much ascribe to a servant leadership uh, model here at Emory. And that has allowed us to implement uh, lean processes, so that information bubbles up from the front line, I should say maybe bubbles down if we reverse the triangle um, so that leaders can then address what the front line identifies. Alignment in a crisis is really important. And because this has been such an unprecedented crisis with COVID, alignment has actually been uh, somewhat easy. Uh, because everybody is looking to share information and to make sure they learn from each other. We are taking care of a disease that we're learning about every day. And we're learning about it's how it is um, acquired in the community, how it is spread in outbreaks, as well as how it affects the human body and organ systems. So alignment has been critical, but also somewhat easy in this environment. I'll talk about some of the ways that we've been able to align our crisis leadership team and form it very quickly. Um, being nimble is also really important. So we have uh, teams of dyads uh, and sometimes triads and maybe a physician leader, administrative leader, uh, nursing leader, 
advanced practice uh, provider engaged. So we have teams of leaders with uh, within our leadership structure. And we've also been very careful to have absolute, so I put communication down here, it should be thread throughout each of these um, bullets is communication, especially during a crisis is absolutely critical. Navigating uncertainty within a group, we have to listen to each other. We have to listen to new information, get data uh, regularly, and then move forward. We're in now this new normal, as a lot of places are, where we're both taking care of COVID patients, non-COVID patients, and um, really having our own people uh, face considerable stress in their personal life. Um, do we send kids back to school, uh, whether they're in college or grade school? Um, you know, how much can you work from home if you have care, caregiver burden? How has this changed the dynamics of your family? Um, and more uh, uncertainty about the degree of community spread and how to um, mitigate that, not only among our patients, but among our coworkers. It is absolutely critical in a crisis to be guided by moral compass. I have a town hall every week that I um, give to my, in my department where I bring pretty much the last week's worth of discussions that have been at huddles, that have been at uh, leadership meetings, um, that have been across the system to bring that to everyone and say, here's new data and just reiterate at each and every opportunity that the most important thing and the thing that keeps me up at night is making sure that the people I work with are safe. We cannot give care to our patients if we don't keep our team safe. And that means um, both in terms of their physical health and their mental well-being. And empathy, um, a moral leader must show and feel empathy. Um, if I say, oh, we need to get back in the hospital and you need to get back in the reading room, it's important to be there, um, but you have personal situation that doesn't make that possible, um, that would not be strong leadership. So having the empathy and while we have guidelines around how we act during a crisis, we have to take everybody's situation into account and understand it and understand what they're going through and the challenges they face, not only at work, but at home as well. Uh, so we rapidly got a uh, command center um, formed in radiology uh, with these teams of dyads and triads and made sure that every leader also had someone that they um, was their number two um, to keep in the loop in case they were sick or got pulled away for some reason. So that uh, we had redundancy, we had, um, we met very regularly. So initially twice a day, even on the weekends, um, but now have decreased uh, that frequency as we've gotten better at managing the disease and our operations at this time. And um, as I mentioned, the weekly town halls, just constantly looking at external situational awareness. Where is the disease? Where, what communities are, is it being spread in? Um, what areas of the state of the country? What are risk factors? And the internal awareness of beds and capacity and PPE um, and our own staffing. So I would say take our own pulse first, emphasize care of our own people first. And it's part of that has been really important with being transparent of healthcare workers and their exposure. So we do track and report anonymously on the incidence of uh, those who have been infected or symptomatic and being tested. I feel that's important for everybody to know. So one of the hardest things about leading in a crisis is making, is making decisions 
with not the full picture available. And there is never the full picture available with this current situation that is so rapidly changing. So it is important to come from, as a leader, from a point of view of humility and to say, I'm making this decision based on discussion with these folks, data that we know here, and then um, pivoting if you need to. Here's additional information. Now we're going to change course and not to be, um, that is not a sign of weakness, but rather a sign of strength in a crisis management situation. So I will stop here and uh, turn things over uh, to my next uh, colleague. I believe that's uh, Dr. Tian. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Melter, for that wonderful talk on uh, forming your crisis leadership team. Um, it's greatly, it's a great talk and, and a lot of great insight in there. Uh, Dr. Laura Oliaga will be speaking next. Uh, Dr. Oliaga is the chair of the radiology department and a neuroradiologist at the hospital clinic in Barcelona, Spain, as well as professor of radiology at the University of Barcelona and scientific director of the European Diploma in Radiology since 2018. She has authored and co-authored more than 50 uh, peer-reviewed uh, scientific papers and 10 book chapter, chapters, and she'll be talking to us about uh, communications in times of crisis. Welcome, Dr. Oliaga. Thank you very much, and I'm very honored to be here and sharing with uh, all of you our experience in uh, this uh, about communication in uh, times of uh, crisis during this uh, pandemic. So what are the main uh, communication goals we consider had been uh, essential during the actual uh, crisis? First, internal communication with a continuous update of uh, the disease to all professionals, as well as the protocols and the organization. Then information to patients coordinated with uh, the government with daily information and publication of uh, our own contents. And finally, fundraising. A fundraising a campaign for research on COVID was launched in the hospital and we receive a large amount of uh, funds uh, from uh, private contribution, from private donors and also from uh, different uh, institutions. And uh, what have been uh, the tools we have used to achieve uh, those goals? Uh, first, a hospital crisis advisory committee was created. And also in the radiology department, we created our own department crisis committee with uh, all the chiefs of sections and representatives of uh, the secretaries, nurses, and technologists. We had uh, regular scheduled meetings in which we share all the information and organize the workflow in the department. Information was published in the web page of uh, the department and available to all the personnel, all the members of uh, the radiology department. And also it was uh, uh, available for all the, um, the members of uh, the, the hospital. All the relevant information about the disease as well as the COVID-19 related standard operating procedures were available in the hospital intranet. And the hospital acted as a media, creating and publishing um, its own uh, contents. So the main messages provided were the epidemiology, healthy habits, and operational procedures for patients. We also distributed specific messages for the imaging department and the procedures indicated in COVID patients, as well as all the ongoing projects and research that uh, were going on in the, in the hospital and specifically in the radiology department. We got uh, direct information from the authorities that was provided daily in this chart. We can see the data and the evolution of the tendency starting in March with the situation in, um, in, in, in our region the 25th of uh, April with a ratio below uh, one. So this is the type of information that was provided to all the personnel daily with the number of hospitalized patients, the number of patients in the intensive care unit, the mortality rate and the average uh, length of stay. 
In this uh, graph that goes from the 15th of March to the 5th of June, we can see in blue the number of hospitalized patients in the hospital and in green the patients that uh, were hospitalized but at home and uh, they were uh, followed by the doctors of uh, the hospital. This is another graph in which uh, we can see the prevalence among the uh, healthcare workers, among the professionals. In blue, the number of hospitalized patients, in red, the number of admissions, and in green, the discharge uh, patients. So we got this information, updated information daily in uh, the internet uh, webpage of the hospital. In this uh, graph, we can see also the mathematical model for predicting hospitalization with a wide range uh, confidence interval of uh, COVID and non-COVID patients and the evolution and how non-COVID hospitalized patients have been increasing as the pandemic evolved. Here, these are numbers uh, specifically from uh, the radiology department, and also this uh, we inform all the personnel in the radiology department every day with uh, these uh, 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 graphs with information about the number of uh, chest x-rays, the portable chest x-rays that were performed in the radiology department, and the ones that were done in the uh, hotel that uh, was uh, con uh, converted in a, in a hospital. So these are the numbers of uh, the test CT studies that were performed in our department starting at the beginning of the pandemic and uh, the high peak in uh, uh, April. Uh, the angio cities and the CT studies that were performed in the radiology department and again we uh, updated this information daily and uh, we provided this information to all the personnel in the, in the hospital. These are um, now, these are uh, the documents and procedures created in the hospital to guide the professionals for the different uh, um, procedures related to COVID patients available for all the personnel at the webpage uh, from how to act in surgical cases to the end of uh, life care and also documents for family support and uh, family uh, care of uh, a family of uh, COVID patients. In the radiology department specifically, we also created uh, a chart uh, to advise and instruct all the professionals on how to act in front of a patient uh, with um, COVID-19 in the different uh, uh, procedures uh, between separating the regular imaging studies from the interventional uh, procedures. So to sum up uh, what uh, we did, uh, the most important issue was to com communicate, adapting this uh, communication to the different working environments and to all levels of uh, the department, uh, from starting from uh, the transporters, the nurses, the technologists, the radiologists, and also the, the secretaries. So we actively manage the media communication with our own contents, including videos and pictures showing the hospital transformation and human success stories and giving thanks also to the donors. So this is uh, the, in the intranet. Um, every day they were posted new uh, contents with updated uh, information of, uh, the pan of the pandemic. And uh, these are some pictures of uh, and some personal stories that were published to positively reinforce all the professionals stories of success and gratitude. So this is the city room where we can see all the professionals working all together as a team uh, to take care of a COVID uh, patient. On this image are the radiologists going to the intensive care unit to perform an uh, ultrasound study. And uh, this is the hotel that was transformed in a, in a hospital. This is one of uh, the beds in the, in the hotel. And this is uh, the group of uh, technologies working with uh, a chest portable equipment to do the chest x-rays there in the, in the hotel. And uh, we also published an emotional um, album in which uh, we share all the experiences, the stories and, uh, from our patients and also from our uh, professionals. And here, this is a story of uh, success, a one patient that was in the intensive care unit and uh, giving thanks to all the personnel working and, uh, in the ICQ uh, 
I see in internship care uh, unit. And uh, these are some references. And thank you very much for your attention. And um, I hope uh, this has been uh, useful for all the attendees. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Dr. Oleaga, for those uh, for sharing your experiences and your insight into how Barcelona dealt with the pandemic surge. Um, it was really useful, and thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Bien Su Tan. He is the chair of the Division of Radiological Sciences at Singapore General Hospital. He too is a member of the RSNA COVID-19 Task Force. Um, welcome, Dr. Tan. Thank you, Dr. Filippi. You have heard from Dr. Meltzer how it's important to be nimble and to make rapid decisions during the pandemic. And therefore, it's sometimes necessary to make course directions, corrections on the fly. My colleagues, Dr. Stay and Cheng, in the recent RSNA webinars, have shared with us how we had initially responded based on our previous painful experience with SARS. The initial response was implemented initially by our large radiology management team. But just like Dr. Meltzer, we realized that we needed a smaller, nimble task force. And this was reorganized on a military model. And the process of decision-making was also loosely modeled after a military format. Basically, when we received a task, we analyzed it we developed various courses of possible action, evaluated them before deciding on the best course of action before implementation, and then we instituted a review process. This diagram shows schematically what I've just shared. And it's important as you understand the task to know the intent of the institution as a whole and also the national intent and policy. As we go into the review process, uh, it is important to, as Dr. Melzer has shared, to assess whether new evidence has emerged, to look at our own review of data and also feedback uh, from the ground. Using this information, we then assess the need for cost correction, decide on the cost correction to take, implement, and then we go into the review cycle again. Just like in Barcelona, uh, we looked at our workload data. Normally, we looked at this on a monthly basis during the pandemic. We looked at it almost weekly and even daily sometimes. And as we looked at the review process to look at cost corrections, we must understand that we are dealing with multiple tasks at different phases often interrelated because we have only common and limited resources. Timelines are compressed and there are concurrent decisions to be made. Let me illustrate some cost corrections that we instituted uh, with a few examples. The first example was how we implemented physical distancing. Once there was evidence of asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission. Here's a picture of our main staff area for meals and breaks. As you can see, the tables and chairs are configured so that five or six people can sit at a table. We immediately realized that meal and break times were very vulnerable because staff are unmasked to have meals and then they tend to socialize. So we immediately reconfigured the table so that we could only seat two staff to a table and immediately look for alternative spaces. We found alternative spaces and deployed additional tables and chairs, installed clear acrylic screens for tables with multiple seats, and then went back to our main uh, staff area where you now see we've taken away chairs so that only a single staff can sit at a single table. Many of the measures we instituted in uh, physical distancing are illustrated in a recent publication. The second example is how we created additional imaging capacity. We realized that we needed extra CT capacity because it took a longer time 
uh, for procedures for COVID-19 patients. We happened to be offered a showroom CT scanner by an industry partner. And fortunately, we had a lead line room that was recently vacated by cardiology. And after a quick assessment of feasibility, made the decision to proceed. And here are the pictures of how from an empty lead line room, we brought the CT uh, equipment in and became operational all within 41 days, uh, record time in my experience. The third example was how we instituted imaging support for a screening facility beyond our emergency department. Post SARS, our institution had a purpose-built multi-story car park designed as an overflow site for emergency department because our emergency department was in a very small uh, space of real estate. Within this facility was a pre-built lead line room for x-rays. And when the decision was made to open this facility as a fever screening area, we deployed staff in a portable x-ray unit within this facility as shown in the picture. Of course, we closely monitored the workload in this facility and within a few weeks, we realized the workload had shot up. It was important to deploy a second unit and we sourced for shipping container that we parked it next to the facility and deployed an additional portable X-ray unit. We reviewed our processes and we realized that with PPE, it took a long time to throughput patients. So colleagues of mine collaborated and came up with building a clear acrylic booth within the container to reduce patient contact. And we acquired chest X-ray through the glass as shown by the picture on the right. And this reduced the need for cleaning and PPE use and increased throughput for our patients. However, on further monitoring the workload, because there were additional facilities that were now open for screening within the community as well as care facilities within the community, the workload in the fever screening area dropped. But at the same time, concurrently, our institution realized that there was a need to increase inpatient capacity, to create additional isolation facilities so that we could get back on track and to prepare for future surges. So we did this by building 50 negative pressure container rooms in an open car park. And we simply um, relocated the X-ray container that we had designed to this facility to support it. So in conclusion, the take home points that I have is that we're dealing with a compressed cycle for decision making and implementation. So it's very important to review after implementation with the data that we have, look at new evidence, get feedback, and then apply the cost corrections if necessary and repeat the cycle. That way we can move everybody in the same direction. In closing, I thank you for the opportunity to share our experience like to acknowledge the fantastic work put in by our Radiology Disease Outbreak Task Force and all my colleagues at the Division of Radiological Sciences at the Singapore General Hospital. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tan, for that really outstanding presentation and for sharing the innovative strategies you use to combat the uh, COVID pandemic, particularly since many of the rurals are still experiencing surge, they really do look to Singapore for guidance. I know other radiology departments around the world. So thank you for being here. Um, I think next we wanted to run a poll <laughs> for the audience. Yes. <laughs> um, so this is for everybody who's listening into the webinar. If you could, and you can choose more than one answer. What is the number one thing that you would want from your leadership team during this pandemic? And these are the options. Policies or guidelines which relate to COVID-19 precautions, transparency of communication, social support programs, dynamic problem solving and course correction, listing and consideration of faculty and or training needs, conflict management or empathy, or maybe more than one. And I think the results will come up in real time. I don't see any result yet.
Yeah, now I see some. There's about 37% transparent communications in the lead followed very closely by policies and guidelines relating to COVID-19 precautions and uh, dynamic problem solving and course correction. Those are the big three by far. Um, with everything else sort of distantly in single digits. So it appears that at least amongst our participating audience this morning, it is transparency of communication, closely followed by guidelines relating to COVID-19 precautions, and then in third, dynamic problem solving and course correction. And if any of our, our uh, panel would like to comment on any of those, or if they're surprised by those choices or not. I, mean, I, I can just uh, comment that uh, we've been very open and transparent in communication as we've heard from some of the other panelists, and that's been very much appreciated. Uh, that's what I hear in feedback that people really appreciate it. So, so that doesn't surprise me. Um, yeah, I'd like to add that uh, I'm not surprised by hearing that clear protocols are required because I think in a crisis situation where there's limited information, people on the ground, while wanting to give feedback, also do want clear and direct instructions to follow. And if you can show that the instructions are very clear, we're working on good protocols, I think you get a lot of trust in the leadership. Yeah, I agree. I think the transparent communication is a very important aspect and something that people are looking for. There is a lot of misinformation out there, both within institutions in terms of processes and policies and, and other aspects, as well as outside our institutions. So just clear, concise uh, uh, and open communication uh, is a very important uh, point of emphasis for a lot of departments. Okay, so we can uh, move to the uh, Q&A portion of the programming. Um, and we will start with a question with for Dr. Schnall. Uh, what method, approach, or medium to communication do you view as most effective for your institution? So as, as I've indicated, uh, we use a multi-threaded approach. Um, so we use every approach available, including you know electronic email communication, town hall, um, uh, communication tiers, communicating to leadership, having them communicate down to their organizations. But one thing I do is I do an awful lot of um, management by walking around, walk around the department, particularly looking for those key influencers in the department to make sure I have a clear conversation with them and communicate whatever messages that I need to communicate and, and use their network naturally to communicate. And that's been very effective. So, so we use all of those methods. I think uh, I would like to ask Dr. Meltzer the following question, like how do you invest in leadership and identify new leaders during a pandemic or a crisis? Because I think that some may argue that maybe different skill sets are needed. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to argue that um, that investment in leadership and strength uh, in a department, in an organization, um, and succession planning needs to start well before a crisis. Uh, so what we've been able to do, as I mentioned, we have sort of a second person for each leader who would be there ready to step up if they became ill. Those people were included in all of the communications. Um, so we're well versed in everything that was happening through the crisis management. Um, another way we got new leaders to flex um, their leadership skills a little bit more was to engage them and switch off and who was leading the daily huddle. Um, it wasn't top down. It was uh, every leader could would run it for several days. And that gave them a flavor for what each of their colleagues were doing um, with how to manage questions, uncertainties, and how to make sure issues were followed up. So I think sometimes a little bit trial by fire uh, during a crisis, but you really need to prepare folks ahead of time. 
uh, with the basic skill set. And then really be surprised how people uh, will rise to the occasion and feel the necessity to help out. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, just to answer a quick question, uh, the slides, uh, Dr. Jules was asking if the slides are available. They're available in the resources tab on the left. Um, uh, another question uh, for Dr. Oliaga, uh, one of the uh, uh, viewers asked what percentage of hospital staff were tested for COVID during the peak? We all were tested for during the pandemic for the uh, with a PCR. Mm -hmm. All the, the staff, all the members, the radiologists, uh, nurses, technologists, and also the transporters and the secretaries. We all were tested during the pandemic, and we were tested twice. And the the ones that were more exposed, as the for example the interventional radiologists or the transporters, and also the technologists that were performing the CT studies. They were follow up and uh, they got uh, every two weeks, they got uh, a test. Um, that's really interesting. And, and Dr. Oli Aga, a follow up question from another one of the uh, webinar participants. Um, how did the rest of Spain handle the pandemic outside of Barcelona? Do you have a sense of how other uh, centers in Spain did with the pandemic, like Madrid or other areas? Yeah, we were in communication with other centers in uh, in other regions in Spain and in most of the hospitals, they were dealing with uh, the pandemic exactly the same way we were uh, doing in our uh, hospital. Also, we, we were in contact with other hospitals here in Barcelona and we all were following the same rules. We got information directly from uh, the government, the Spanish government, and also the local uh, governments. And we were following the instructions all together, exactly the same in all the different uh, regions in, in Spain. Thank you, Dr. Oliaga. Um, a question for Dr. Tan. Uh, in, in your leadership, what are important steps to take to create a culture of communication and feedback from the bottom up. How do you hear the voices of those that are less apt to speak? Thanks, uh, Mahmoud. That's a great question. And uh, in fact, I think Dr. Snell has partly uh, answered that question. I think in our Asian culture, uh, there's a tendency for you know, uh, the subordinates not to question uh, the leaders as much. So it was something that we were very uh, aware of. Um, we knew that in this day and age with different generations of staff, that no one medium or platform of communication would be enough. So like uh, Dr. Chanel, uh, we use the official email for official policy communications. But on top of that, uh, we have a officially approved uh, taxing format called Tiger Tax. We created multiple groups uh, for that, and uh, that was used for rapid dissemination of uh, work-related information. At the same time, because we were physically distanced, it was important to set up uh, socially connected platforms, and we have an officially approved uh, social platform at our institute called Workplace at Facebook, and we use that extensively. And we also use uh, WhatsApp for social matters. Uh, we kept emphasizing to all our leaders to communicate, communicate, communicate. And just like Dr. Snell, uh, walking the ground was very important. We instituted daily walkabouts where leaders uh, uh, participated. And that way you can see whether the measures that we wanted to implement were successful. And if not, you could gather immediate feedback from the ground. And it's actually a whole slew of measures that uh, help us uh, achieve the feedback uh, we desire. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Tan. And um, I have a question for all of the panelists who were invited to participate today. When you look back on your leadership approaches and, and processes during the pandemic, um, is there anything that you would have done differently 
Um, and whoever would like to be the first <laughs> to volunteer. Sure, I, I, I can tell you something that I think we could have done better on, particularly early in the pandemic, there were very quickly evolving sets of processes and policies. And we were a little late um, within our department to come up and to be able to post um, a um, sort of standard set of you know up-to-date policies that everyone could rely on and could go to and knew that whatever they were hearing back and forth from you know uh, from chat or they could go somewhere to check and we were pretty we were later than we should have been in doing that in retrospect we would have sort of stood that up quicker I'll, I'll answer next. Um, I, I shared in my talk how we, after a few weeks, reconstituted our task force in a smaller, nimble uh, organization. I think uh, looking back, we should have thought about it earlier before a crisis to know that the larger uh, management team would not cope in a crisis and that could have been instituted uh, much faster. Uh, I think we still continue to grapple with communication. And I hear from uh, Dr. Snell's talk that you have to uh, repeat things seven times. So I'll remember that and uh, do that more often. I might add that initially we had daily communication across a large group of leaders. And that included Saturdays and Sundays, whether people were off or working. Um, and we, we all felt it was necessary at that time because of the rapidity of new information, but we probably persisted too long. And it was great relief when, uh, <clears throat> when individuals were tasked with managing uh, weekend issues and escalating as necessary, but not gathering everybody together and giving more wellness time and more rest time to our folks. Yeah, I can add that uh, if uh, what we learned from this uh, crisis is that sometimes it was too much information. And uh, so we have to focus on the information and to specifically use uh, like a specific messages to give, be given mm -hmm. to uh, the different uh, uh, members of uh, the radiology department because sometimes it was too much information and people didn't get uh, the correct or the right messages. Mm -hmm. So I will focus on exactly what messages should be given to each of uh, the different uh, groups in the radiology department. Wonderful, thank you all for those responses. Um, the next question is for Dr. Mahoney. Uh, what specific aspect of your leadership approach was most key to your institution's success in navigating the pandemic? I think I have to just reiterate what the other speakers have already said, and that is um, communicating. Communication was absolutely the most important thing. There's lots and lots of things that are important uh, in, a, in this situation and important in a leader, but I think communication was the most important thing. And as that Dr. Oliega just said, finding that balance between giving the information that's necessary, but I think all of us at some point felt like we were in COVID information overload. So what was the right balance? What information was vital? And then when you gave that information, being really genuine and transparent and, and saying, that there were many times that we didn't have all the answers, we didn't have all the information, we didn't have all the data. And, and to be able to just say, I'm gonna give you my best go at it right now, and that's as good as I can do, mm -hmm. and being genuine about that. Um, I, so I think communication was the biggest in my department. I think the second, and it kind of goes along with it, was um, remaining calm. Um, there were a lot of people that were very, very exercised about this. Um, there was a communications in my department that were going around at one point about making out wills and signing uh, health uh, policies and things like that. So I think being very calm and, and having more of a steadying um, influence mm -hmm. on, on everyone. Um, at the same time, having to be respectful of where people were coming from because people were genuinely concerned and worried and 
and I couldn't um, ignore that or belittle that, but at the same time, trying to calm and, and, and create an atmosphere and a culture where we were saying, we're, we're working on this, we've got this, we're, we're together, we're going to make it through this. And, and that, that calming sense, I think, was also um, important in, in my department. It was a lot of work. It still is. Still is. All right. Any more questions or should we wrap it up now? All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead then and um, thank our, our panelists today for outstanding presentations. Thank you all very much. Great, great amount of information. Really well done. Um, thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Thanks to all of you who are online attending the webinar. Um, I appreciate your presence here as well. Please look at the, the resources panel, which is on the left part of your screen. Um, there are details there for how you can earn CME for having attended this webinar. Um, in the chat and resources panel, there's also uh, information and how you can connect and, and uh, communicate through the RSNA committee uh, community, sorry, community sites. And I hope that you will do that and that I would encourage you to keep the conversation going, uh, go into the RSNA community sites, um, ask your questions, dialogue with your colleagues. Um, RSNA leadership gets on and comments as well. So it's a great place to keep chatting. And um, again, just thanks to everyone who participated today. I think it was a really great session and um, stay safe. Thanks all.